Hello there, everybody in UK Grown Bookland. I'm here with Nina Allen to talk about her latest novel, Good Neighbours. If you could tell us a bit about the plot, please, Nina. Yeah, sure. Um, the Good Neighbours is a novel that explores the background to a family crime. Um, the protagonist, the main character, is a woman called Kath. And she spent her teenage years on an island uh, off the west coast of Scotland. And while she was living there, her very best friend, Shirley, together with Shirley's family, her mother and her two-year-old brother, were brutally murdered, shot dead. And it was always taken for granted that the murderer was Shirley's violent and rather taciturn father, Johnny. Um, and this crime, the, the closeness to the crime and the aftermath has a profound effect on Kath as she goes forward with her life. And it isn't until 20 years later when the book opens that Kath decides she's got to finally get to the bottom of what happened, what really happened to her friend Shirley. She's never been completely happy with the idea that it was Johnny that was the killer. So she returns to the island where she spent her teenage years and starts digging deeper into the mystery yeah. and the surrounding events. Yeah, I think that's probably a good summary of it. Um, I was curious to uh, find a bit more about your musical taste because, of course, Kath is um, works in the record shop, and I believe you did too. I certainly did. I certainly did. I worked in the um, music for fifteen years, and the piece I've I've never used it in my writing, but it seemed very natural to give Kath effectively my job, the job I had for a long time, yeah. and all those details are very much drawn from my own experience and very fondly remembered and I did the buying of I, I bought the classical stock and also the folk jazz and world exactly as Kath does so I got to listen to a lot of music um, I got to explore my own musical interests and I got to hear um, stuff before anybody else, which is always a bonus of the job. Yeah, I, I do like to find out um, what the musical background to, to a, a lot of the authors are, especially when they notice the, and mention the music in the books. I, um, I, it, it's, yeah. I mean, music was, it was no accident that I ended up in the record store. I mean, music was profoundly important to me from a young age. I was um, 12 years old and I had pneumonia and I was confined to the sick room essentially for a month. I was off school for, you know, all that time. And during that time I read and I listened to the radio and I, re I listened to Radio 3 and I got to, you know, really, really have this strange and, and passionate, interest in classical music. That's where that began. And indeed, I've, I've just, the manuscript I have recently finished, I explore that a lot more. It's a very important subject to me. Um, speaking of important subjects, I mean, fairies is going to be a little bit different for the group to uh, cover, but um, I was interested as to the genesis of the idea and why you chose fairies? Well, I've been thinking and writing about this a lot recently, obviously, because people have been asking me, and I think the best answer I can give as to why the fairy world has always, it's, it's, it's fascinating because it's something that we all encounter when we're really small. I mean, if you think back to your own childhood, you'll probably have been told, oh, you know, the tooth fairy, you lose lose a tooth, put it under your pillow. The fairies are going to come and give you a 
reward. And I, I started thinking about this a number of years ago, how weird it is that parents are really quite happy to tell kids that essentially strange creatures are going to creep inside their rooms at night and take their teeth. And of course, the natural question for a writer of speculative fiction after that is, yeah, but what are they doing with the teeth? <laughs> I, I was sort of, um, I'm fascinated by the ubiquitousness of fairy mythology. And in the novel, Kath and her friend Alice explore this, how there are fairy myths all over the world. It's completely it's completely universal, this fascination, the idea that there was an elder race that inhabited the earth before us or in tandem with us, a parallel universe. I love the idea of there being a world potentially right under your nose that um, only some people can see. And the fact that this is this world in literature, in art, in history has often been associated with madness and with people who are experiencing profound mental health difficulties or flights of the imagination or fantasy. This led me to it even more because it, it's sort of revelatory of of crisis of some kind you you, yeah. you see you see what is not there what is that saying about your state of mind it's a, just a gift to a writer you can you can really use this idea to draw and to penetrate deeper into character because they do go into uh parallel universes and age in their own time according to your, your book um you know when you know, when um, you think that fairies can age in their own time, um, the idea about time shifting, did you ever think about that during covering the book just to make it a bit different or did that not? The, the, I, th I think the sort of the time, the time shift idea about the idea if you go into fairyland and um, when you return, you are the same age, but the rest of the world has aged around you. I, it was, I, re, um, has been explored in famous works of literature, the legend of Oshin, most especially, um, who spends, I think it's three weeks or something in fairyland, and he comes back and it's 30 years and the, the whole world has changed. Um, Graham Joyce wrote a novel called Some Kind of Fairy Tale, which is set in the summer of 76, um, which I remember well, which was kind of a haunted magical time anyway. And he writes about, you know, some, a, a young girl who goes missing in fairyland and eventually returns and like into it. And, and she's essentially an alien when she comes back. And I think the good neighbors, I think the good neighbors draws on this in a more, um, a sort of almost allegorical sense because the character yeah. who's obsessed with fairies, Johnny, he is initially told the fairy legends by his grandmother. His, his grandmother is very important to him. She's the closest person to him. And you could say she's the only one that ever really knew him. And she told him fairy mythology essentially to console him and to offer him an escape from what was going on in his day-to-day -day life and with his own abusive father. And I think it's this kind of escape into the mountains and his own version of fairyland that sort of stops time for Johnny. And in a very real sense, I don't think Johnny ever grows beyond that. He, he after having, as it were, glimpsed fairyland, he finds it very, very difficult to exist in the ordinary world, his difficulties with violence, his difficulties with forming relationships, they're all very present and they really drive the novel. And in a way, the only, he, this constant yearning to get back to the mountains and to his fairy love has almost stolen his heart and mind. Um, when I was looking into um, 
your background, you covered Russian at university, and I just thought that that was a really interesting angle. Um, um, when you were writing your earlier books in this one, would you say you uh, learned in style from Russian literature or? It's a, it's a profound inspiration to me. I'd say that doing um, reading Russian classics quite young, I still know the Russian classics better than I know a lot of the English classics. It, it cast a certain sort of literature into really prime importance, the kind of literature that asks big questions God, the devil, art, um, searching for the truth, revolution, imprisonment, artistic freedom. All these themes are so, so strong in Russian literature through the 19th century and well on into the 20th and to the present day. And in my, my story cycle, Ruby, um, does draw directly on my experiences reading Russian literature and indeed going to Russia um, in the late 80s. I sort of, I've used a reimagined kind of alternative Russia several times in stories. Um, I am, there are, there are still a lot of themes that I want to explore and it's or it's coincidence because a lot of the questions you're asking me are sort of pertaining to work that's still in the pipeline. And this very afternoon, uh, I have been rereading Nabokov's Pale Fire, which is a an absolutely seminal book for me. And it's going to have a place in what I'm writing now. And th th I've spent most of the afternoon wondering if I've bitten off more than I can chew because the the book is just incandescent it's just superb it doesn't you know I mean you think of, of that book it's half a century old it could have been written yesterday but I mean Rus the Russian the, the passion of Russian literature is ever present for me yeah when we were talking before you were saying that it takes about eight, 18 months for a story to come to flourishin. Um, when uh, when you decided to switch to a little bit more of the crime side of the element, did did that um, was that any harder for, to switch genre slightly? It's in it's really interesting um, because I didn't actually think of it as a switch. I've written quite a few in my more overtly speculative stories. There are quite a few crime inflected stories among them. And indeed I've had two stories in Best of a Mammoth Book of Best British Crime. Um, I've had a story in a magazine called Crime Wave. I've always absolutely loved crime fiction. What I love about crime fiction is the uh, my my very good friend Joel Lane who is sadly no longer with us um, he was also a, a speculative writer who happily um, wrote crime fiction he wrote a lot of supernatural crime stories they're fantastic and I remember a conversation I had with him it must be getting on for 10 years ago now and I was thinking about writing more crime because of my you know real love of the genre and he said to me something I've never forgotten crime fiction it's very simple all you need is a crime or a criminal to write about and I just found that really it's sort of both very simple and very very liberating because you have got this structure you have got a crime or a criminal to write about and within that stricture within that dictate you've got infinite freedom and what i wanted to do with the good neighbors i suppose what the the chief challenge was was to write a novel that 
was completely satisfying on the level of crime fiction. In other words, a crime reader coming to this book who hadn't ever read any of my speculative fiction had never heard of me before could pick up The Good Neighbours and read it and enjoy it as a as an investigation an investigative crime story and the solution to the mystery could be completely prosaic non-supernatural and it would work on that level but I also wanted to include interwoven with that a speculative element that would give an extra depth and an extra layer of meaning to the story, an extra insight into characters, and that would be there for people that, readers that liked that kind of mystery and liked that kind of alternate way of thinking. So it wasn't so much a change, it was a challenge. <laughs> yeah, I would say it's, it's a crossover, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when when you were talking about um, murder houses, I, mean, I know that that's quite a uh, an uh, interesting angle for fans of true crime. What was the research angle that you did for that? Because it's a bit um, different as a basis for a novel that's fictional. I absolutely well. I love investigative true crime. I'm really I really love reading it. I really enjoy that. And I personally like seeing where things happened and not just the house, but the locale, the ambience of a place and time. I find that, you know, that's just fascinating on a literary level anyway. And Photographer. She's working in the record store, but she's also a photographer. She's had several exhibitions. She wants to go freelance. She's sort of working up to that through the novel. And um, I had the idea of her photographing these murder houses and, the, and most especially non-famous, like ordinary houses where it sort of like could be on an estate could be down the bottom of your road, could be in a seaside town. Um, the, I had that, I, I remember, it must be at least five years ago. So this is what it's like about ideas taking their time to germinate. I read a fascinating piece. Um, I think it was in The Observer about this very subject where about people who had bought and were now living in murder houses and to them they were just their normal house where they were living the murder might have happened 50 years ago 10 years ago 100 years ago but it was just their home and the experience that they had living in such a house and the the response was really various there were some people that were just honestly i don't want to know anything about it it happened 100 years ago it's times moved on there were others who really literally wanted to know everything and became kind of obsessed true crime fans themselves through through buying and living in the house. The, the one that struck me most was a guy who ended up at the time of writing, uh, at the time of the article being published. He was living in um, Julia Wallace's, the Wallace's house in Anfield, Liverpool. And that was a really infamous murder way back in the in the 20s and he was living in the house and he described the experience of having you know just him sitting in his front room people coming up knocking on the door asking if they could be shown the living room where the murder happened photographing through the window all these things that happened and he was he was really sanguine about it he was really kind of well you know what you're going to do I thought it was admirable that he was so kind of cool with it because I don't I know I wouldn't be. But the idea of this about the multi-layered history of potentially every house in the country really stuck with me. And I just, yeah, I stored that away. I definitely wanted to use it. Yeah, because it's very 
uh, fascinating than our idea, especially on a smaller, small island like you based the book on. Yes. Yeah. With the community knowing a lot about it. And everything. Well, what, what was it about small islands for you? The the it's 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 an interesting genesis the book had because when I first started laying down the bones of the book, I wasn't living on an island. I was living in um, Mid Devon, in rural Mid Devon, a long way from well, not a long way, but some way from the sea. I had a completely different landscape around me, and there was a real murder that happened very close to where I was living in the 1970s. And I first heard about that murder 30 years ago when I was working in the record store when I was living in Exeter. And it was one of those murders that made a big impact on the community because it was a small community. And that stayed with me. And I had this idea from it. I mean, I hasten to add the action of the good neighbours in no way literally reflects that real life murder. It was just the idea of a family murder in a rather closed setting, a small community that appealed to me, especially given that the original murder has never been 100% solved. They know exactly who was involved. They, it's impossible now to know exactly what happened. That also appealed to me. And as I say, I'd got the bare bones of the story down. And then my partner and I moved house. And we came 500 miles north to the Isle of Bute off the west coast of Scotland. And it seemed the, the change and the striking, all pervasive nature of the landscape just demanded that I write about it. So I had to change a lot in terms of the ambiance of the book. But the heartland subject, if you like, the idea of a family murder in a closed community that still was a mystery remained pretty much the same. And that's the strand of the story that just kept me going through that process of transition into the new landscape. And I think the island setting, if anything, was even stronger and better for the story than the rural Mid Devon setting. Because of course, on an island, there is, there's um, very limited opportunities for a anything to happen without people around knowing either who or what happened. The memories are long. Many people who live on our island have, have not only lived there their, here their whole lives, but their parents and grandparents have as well. So these things leave very, very deep scars when they do anything that does happen on an island. And there was also the fascinating practical implications which come into the good neighbours quite a lot because, of course, if somebody has committed a murder on an island, how are they going to leave? How are they going to escape? And what implications does that have for the investigating officers? So it really did help me out in all manner of ways, having this island setting. Yeah, I must admit, I, I do like I, I do like island same books. Is, is there anybody that you've read recently, or why you're write, writing the book that might have like uh, ins inspired or influenced the island approach? The island approach. Um, there's some fantastic. Um, novels by the crime writer Peter May um, set in um, Stornoway on Lewis, um, the Black House trilogy, and subsequent novels of his that he's set in the northwest 
of Scotland and in particular on the islands of the Hebrides. And his landscape writing is just so powerful. And of course, his sense of island life, his sense of being part of a very small, closely knit and sometimes overly curious community. You know, it, it's, yeah, it's very, I, anyone, anyone who's interested either in Scotland, in islands, in crime literature should check out his books because they're, they're, you know, they're, the setting of those is just superb. And I discovered him probably round, exactly round about when I first moved here. It, that's a uh, really good, really good tip. I know, I know that other members of the interview team have interviewed him before, but I've not really had a look. Um, I was interested in um, your, the, the fact that you, your partner's a writer too, yeah. because um, I know that uh, when I when I write, um, it helps me to influence um, or um, compile my writing because I dictate everything. So I just wondered um, how co collaborative is is your writing and does your partner read any of it in your writing? We have a. We have a real, I'd say we have a really close creative relationship. Um, the, the most important aspect of that, I would say, is a deep understanding of how the other wants and needs to live and work. You know, we're here in the same house. Um, we are on, our studies are on different floors. We're both very happy in the house together but each understands that it might be you know four or five hours in, in where we don't see each other or speak to each other because we're both just working and that sense of having that freedom and it not ne not needing to explain it not needing to make excuses that you got to get on your own to write or that you need to go on a research trip to write those kind of practical things we're always saying how much we take them for granted in each other because that that level of understanding was just instantaneous between us and we feel i know we feel both of us very lucky to have that in terms of the practical day-to-day -day business the nuts and bolts of writing we both have different approaches like i read his drafts as he's working he'll like write 5,000 words and then I'll read it because he really enjoys having somebody to relate what's going on somebody that knows what's happening somebody that he can bounce an idea off and that re works really well because I love doing that I love knowing what he's writing and what's going on as he's doing it and it's different the other way around because he never gets to see what I've written until I have got the final draft that I'm effectively ready to send to my agent um, because and the, the reasons reason for that is very simple is because he is completely incapable of giving an overview um, he he can't just say um, oh, yes, I loved it, or no, I didn't. He will look like fixate on minor points of text and minor detail. So it's pointless until I know that I've got those details, how I want them, and his commentary will be valid or useful. It's just very frustrating to have somebody um, fixate on something that you know you're going to change anyway. So <laughs> he, yeah. gets the whole, he gets the whole book to read. And he is always my first reader. And he's yeah. he's the, the harshest critic, um, which I love because, you know, after that, sending it into your agent is is fine. But, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's he's a great reader. He's I've, I don't think 
in all my years of reading and writing, I don't, I don't think I've ever come across anyone who understands craft so well as he does. He knows, he understands, he's got this instinctive understanding of how stories are built and structured. And his own very complex novels um, reflect that love of structure. And I think we've both kind of, we both bounce off each other with that because we both write really kind of structurally strange books. But I didn't catch it from him. I read him, I, I, I was doing, I, I read him long, long before, 10 years plus before he was my partner. So it's not his fault directly. <laughs> it's, it must, must, must be really nice though, because I must, I must admit, um, with, with, with um, my assistants, I've decided that I'm going to write it with one assistant, and then when it comes to the editing stage, I'll give it, give it to another one because um, I come from an academic background and uh, I'm very analytical, and uh, so is my assistant. And as you say, you do get um, fixated on the small stuff if you give it to, if you just focus on it too early. Yeah. Exactly. You need the freedom of the something something else, my partner. One the the probably the biggest change my partner made to my writing practice was in the matter of how to draft. And when we first met, I was I I do a lot of work on a text, but I'd essentially edit on the page. I'd write a draft and then comb through, edit, edit, comb through, comb through, comb, and that's how I do it. And he said to me, no, that, you know, that way madness lies. What you've got to do is write your first draft and then you print out that draft and you open a new document and you start typing from page one and you literally rewrite the book line by line and like you, you, you just will not know you're born because the the improvements that you'll make on literally every single page will be beyond anything you could ever achieve just by editing on the page. And when he told me about this, I thought that is the most horrific thing I've ever heard. And there is no way I will ever do that. I couldn't think of anything more awful. I just thought that would be so tedious. And a couple of months later, I was working on a piece of short fiction and it wasn't going brilliantly. I was had sort of problems with it. And so I did more to pass the time, more to procrastinate than anything else. I thought, right, I'm going to try his method. I'm just going to print out one page and try it and see what happens. And it was just a revelatory. It was just like a revolution in my head. And from that moment on, I've always used that method. And I, I I will even use it, you know, it won't just be one new draft, it could be two or three, depending on how many structural changes yeah. need to happen. And it's just so, th the first draft is a living hell, because you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I, I'm not, I mean, I know there are writers, and many of them within the crime community, who literally cannot start writing until they have got a breakdown of each chapter, what happens in each chapter, how many chapters, all that. I have never written like that. I can't do it. I start with a character and a situation and I inch forward from there and I keep inching forward until I have a draft. And at that point I have got a story and that may have taken me six months plus to achieve. But then at that point I've got a story. I know what's actually happening. And then writing, additional drafts to make that better and to firm up all the cues everything that the writer everything that the reader will be looking for all those little clues you can then build them into the beginning of your narrative in the full knowledge of what's going to happen at the end and so you know though that kind of repeated drafting is essential to the kind of writer i am especially who you know is not it is very much a much a pantser rather than a planner. Yeah, I must admit, I I am too. I couldn't plan it. I couldn't yeah. plan it. Um, when when you're working from the point of view, starting with the character, um, 
giving Kath a, uh, a a disability with her eyes? Did that did that come autumn? Did that when did that come in in the process? It's um, based on it's mine. <laughs> So that was quite, that was sort of a, a I have never, ever um, tried to write about it. And again, it was sort of like, how do I do that? Can I do that? Can I describe that? Do I want to describe that? Is that interesting to the reader? And I just decided to have a go. And yeah, so it's woven into the text um, in kind of interesting ways and I guess the whole book, you could analyze the whole book in terms of ways of seeing. Um, yeah. Kath has ways of seeing that basically make use of all her senses because she is, because she has a visual disability, um, other senses are used in tandem with her eyesight and augment it. And it's a very interesting trying to describe that Johnny has ways of seeing he can see or believes he can see the fairy world and Alice um who is we meet um when Kath returns to the island and who Kath forms a close relationship with Alice has ways of seeing because of her deep love affinity for and understanding of mathematics and numbers and this enables her to see the world in a different way and that is part of her understanding of what happens to Johnny and indeed she casts extra light on that because of yeah. numbers and weird geometry which again is a skewed way of seeing. So the, the, the choice I made over giving Kath a visual impairment in its turn inflected the whole text, which I kind of liked in the end. I found that sort of re really interesting the way that turned out. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't think it was overdone. I thought, yeah, I thought it was, yeah, I thought it worked well. Um, because I've always wondered how I was gonna do it if I did mine, like whether I'd, whether I'd put this, uh, my disability in or not. It is, um, it's a tricky decision, though, isn't it? Because you don't want it, it to overburden the text. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, wh when you're working on um, the short stories, is there any kind of style approaches that are different to the longer stuff? Because I've, I've been working on short stories myself, so I'm always a little bit fascinated with the difference. It's... Oh, it's really, at the, I find that's this such an interesting question because I think I started writing short fiction almost by accident because the way, um, the way I came into being a published writer through science fiction, fantasy and horror, the traditional route into those genres has always been for you know for a century it's been short fiction and you go back to weird tales you go back to the pulp magazines and the, you know Lovecraft was writing short fiction um H.G. Wells was one of the first writers to be published in the pulp magazines in the United States because they sort of just shipped his stories out there and published them in in the pulps so SF has this incredibly long, rich, and I'd say democratic history of short fiction, whereby you would get brand new writers um, rubbing shoulders with greats of the genre. And this is still very much the case today. It's one of the things I love about the speculative fiction community is that, you know, that is, you, you can, when I first started writing for publication, I didn't know anyone in the community. I didn't know personally to go round to their place, any other writers. I was just somebody sitting in their room writing short stories and sending them off to magazines. And the fact that you can do that and you can still do that 
I th I just think it's one of the one of the it is democratic. It's one of the best things about speculative fiction. And so that's how I started writing. I didn't it, it never really crossed my mind because I was used to reading science fiction, fantasy and horror and the best of the year. I used to love those bests of the year you get where you could read through 30 stories and find out who the new writers were, who was writing what, what kind of themes were going around. And I absolutely read them cover to cover and dreamed of getting my own stories in there one day. And so I wrote short fiction. It didn't occur to me to start off with a novel. I think that would have like terrified me because, you know, like you, I came from, I was, in academe for a while at the time and studying studying um, the real giants of literature sort of all, can almost give you stage fright. You sort of like, oh my God, you know, how can I approach this? And the idea of writing a 5,000 word story seemed at least doable, seemed at least something I could do and send off and see what happened and I guess I just continued doing it um, because it's something I enjoy. You can try out an idea in a piece of short fiction. You can even get to know a character. I have multiple stories in um, the books of mine, The Silver Wind and Ruby. I call those story cycles because all the stories are linked together through character or place or both. And I still really like doing that. I've got a collection of short fiction coming out in the autumn, which collects stories basically from a decade ago, right up till last year. And several of them are written, you know, five plus more years apart. And they're kind of like, oh yeah, I wonder what happened to that character. I want to revisit them. And so I sort of form longer pieces of fiction out of short fiction. That's something I love doing again because I'm obsessed with form and what form a narrative can take. And the idea of discrete little pieces of short fiction that are somehow part of a larger universe of story has always been really profoundly attractive to me. I absolutely love that. And so it's versatile it's groundbreaking, it's experimental. You can do anything you want with a piece of short fiction. And I guess my only problem with the form is that now everything I write seems to want to become a novel. So I have real yeah. problem writing short. And the last couple of projects I've done in short fiction, one of which was a story um, that was on radio for new voices um, at the beginning of the year and another story that I've written for um, a podcast series called Inventive, which is to do with science, scientists and creative writers and how the two into how, how one can illuminate the work of the other. Both the brief for both of those pieces was like literally 2000 words absolute max. And again, that was a that was a really interesting challenge. And I, I was quite surprised I managed to do it. <laughs> and it, it gave me a rather a taste for that again, sort of ideas of thinking, well, maybe I could do 20 of those and then yeah. link together. So I do still love the form and I would encourage, you know, I'd say to any any new writers. Uh, I, I did recently do a, a mentorship program for the Wigtown Book Festival and my my mentee was, again, he was a non-fiction writer, a very practised one, a um, very good one, but he'd tried to write a novel and it was huge. It was sort of like, it was way out of hand. And um, I, I just said, row back write a 5,000 word story set in this world, get to know these characters, get to know one character before you introduce 20 more. And he tried this and it, it was, it had a brilliant effect. It was, we, we were both really delighted with the way that that turned out. 
And I'd say it's a great, a great tool as well as a beautiful form in itself, the short story. Yeah, that sounds like a great method. I might, might well have to use that because that was prevalent in your previous book as well, Dolls, because there's a lot of um, short stories which influence the outcome of that book. I love doing that. I absolutely, you know, um, in the doll maker, the right, of course, the fairy tale, you know, the fair. Once I started mentioning the fairy tales in that narrative, I thought, well, I'm going to actually have to write one. And um, I, I did a couple. And then my editor, when I went in to um, do the, the edit, we do an editorial meeting, a read through before I do the final edit. And he said, oh, you've mentioned a story here that never turns up in the text. And I said, well, I didn't want to overbalance the text with too many pieces of short fiction. And he said, oh, no, no, write it. And so I had to write another one. But I enjoyed that, too. It was some um, really fascinating extra story. It's, it, how did you decide to balance the short stories with the longer form in dolls because it was um, different in the style? Again, it, it was very organic. Um, I originally, the fairy tale segments in The Dollmaker, which are ostensibly by another writer, an earlier write, a writer sort of writing um, around the time of the Second World War onwards, I wanted that kind of timeless quality to them. I didn't want them to be pastiche style. I wanted them to be their own thing, but I wanted them to feel as though they could have been written at any time. And I originally just sort of wrote vignettes in that style, and then I worked them up to full length stories. And then the important thing, once again, putting them, arranging them in the text so that the... Um, reverberation, shall we call it, the reverberation between the outside narrative and the inner narrative of each story were all in the right place so that a reader coming to each tale would ooh, get that frisson of recognition of either yeah. something they had just read in the main text or something that was going to happen 30 pages later and then redrafting, redrafting as a whole to make it contiguous and to make it smooth. Um, it did take a lot of thinking about, but it was, uh, that book, that book <laughs> forgive my language, was a bastard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I originally, I, I, had, I had the idea for it 10 years before I finally felt ready to write it. So, um, yeah, it was. It was. It was finally getting on top of it. Felt really great. It, yeah, it must have been a really interesting challenge. But I thought we'd. I thought we'd end on something that we were talking about before this started the interview. Um, Conan Doyle, because I know that the uh, group would be interested to see your opinion on that. Well, yes. I mean, I, I'm going to be writing more about this for a blog post in a couple of weeks time i've been doing to celebrate the good neighbors coming out i've been doing various essays about fairy mythology fairies in literature and um fairies victorian fairy painting will be my next one and then after that i'm going to be writing about conan doyle and this very strange incident in his life um the, the cottingley fairies um, where there were these two young girls who took a series of photographs ostensibly showing fairies and showing themselves with fairies. And these, they're, they're like, I mean, you, I'm sure many um, listeners will be, you know, fully aware of the idea of ghost photographs, the kind of fake photographs, which I use double exposures and so on to show ghosts supposedly hovering in the background of a room or um, as somebody who isn't there. Um, the, the Cottingley Fairies photographs were akin to that in that they were they used 
well, <laughs> it's, it's it's really interesting. The more you read about it, because the 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 women, as they were when it when they finally admitted that the photos were a hoax, one of the sisters still, until the day of her death, maintained that one of the photos was genuine, which is again a fact about the whole case that I love. But the Conan Doyle angle, absolutely fascinating. You've got this great man of medicine. Um, you've got this great man of the law. You've got this great man of, you know, the gr great granddaddy of detective fiction. It's logic and reason and a master of plotting. He um, fell hook, line and sinker for the Cottingley Fairies photographs. He was absolutely bewitched by the idea of these fairies and held talks on them, lectures, se seminars. You know, he was completely into it. And I I just love the idea of this, this contrast between who he was and the way his mind worked. And yet that innate desire for mystery, that innate desire to penetrate a realm beyond our own um, was so great even in him. The, the storyteller in him, the magician in him, won over the logical mind to to express a belief, uh, to be prepared to believe in fairies. I I, I think it's a wonderful story. Um, I think somebody has actually written a novel on this theme, but I shall be exploring that in greater depth when I come to write about it. Yeah, it's, it's always something that's fascinated me because I was talking about it with Laura Purcell when she was doing her book as well because he's obviously he's also got an interest in um, mystics and people totally people. yeah brilliant um, I, I was also going to ask what what was up next for you because as as readers all know when authors are promoting their current book it probably means that there's another book in the pipeline somewhere that you're working on at the moment. There certainly is. Um, I've recently finished um, my next novel, which is, I call it my lockdown novel, although lockdown does not feature, you will be very happy to hear. But it was, again, it was a novel that was completely thrown off kilter by the fact of lockdown, by the fact of the pandemic. I was probably... 30 odd thousand words into writing something um, last March when suddenly our entire world changed. And I was brought up completely short and I, you know, news was happening so fast. The world was changing so fast. It seemed somehow imperative to respond and yet impossible to respond because we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know what was going to happen. We still don't. We, you know, the, the really real definitive history of what has happened to us as a world, as a planet in the last two years. We're, you know, we're, it's going to be 50 years plus before we fully understand its impact and even the facts surrounding it. But the writing of my um, next novel was influenced by it in that it ended up being a novel about belief, about conspiracy theories, about the fear of contagion and all those things are in that book um, but you will have to wait until 2023 before you can read it <laughs> that's absolutely absolutely fine i must admit i do uh, like a, a long leading because you get anticipation more i, I need i need it because i i need to have like a year completely with nothing going on with either my last book or the next book so i can write the book after that without without having to think about either the book behind or the book <laughs> so i like i need to have that gap myself and um i think i think it's fine i think it works out well for readers as well i hope so anyway yeah is it another cross book uh, with crime and, there's amazing uh, crime there is really there's really it was it started out as a police procedural. You can see how in love with crime I am. And it does feature as its main character, a private investigator who has had to leave the police force under circumstances that will be revealed and that are not good. 
So yeah. yeah, it's it's another crime weirdness crossover, and I'm really happy about that. What is it about private detectives and uh, civilian detectives that you find uh, that is your crime thing? It's very simple. It's sort of like I know that there are dozens of absolutely, you know, brilliant police procedural writers out there who know the current police form back to front and sideways and it's an incredible skill and it's one that I, I just I have not got at the moment I do I am not up to speed as much as I would want to be I could probably blag it but I don't like that I, I'm really fascinated by I really love work novels I really love the intricacies of like a, the boringness of the day-to-day -day job it's something I absolutely adored in there's a um a novel by Tony White called The Fountain in the Forest which is a brilliant weird crime novel but the whole of the first section is just pure procedural and it's just brilliant it's just like absolute nuts and bolts and I love that and I sort of read that and I think I can't, you know, I I can't do that to the standard I want to. So I'm going to choose for my detectives, civilian detectives, citizen detectives, the kind of detective that I could imagine myself being, I guess. Yeah. So it is, yeah, it's a matter of the how rather than the why. Well, thank you so much for such an interesting hour. Um, I think that um, the group will be really interested to see your next book. And uh, for anybody out there that hasn't read The Good Neighbours yet, I would highly recommend it. Well, thank you so much to everyone and thank you. It's been a wonderful conversation and I, you know, I've really enjoyed it. So thank you.